Chapter Five of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter Five. Extremely dark of hair, of eyes and skin, moderately tall and shaped with that compact, breathtaking symmetry that the male figure sometimes assumes, a brilliantly devised, aggressive head topping his broad shoulders, graceful, a man vehemently alive, a man with a promise of a young god, Hugo at eighteen. His emotions ran through his eyes like hot steel in a dark mold. People avoided those eyes. They contained a statement from which ordinary souls shrank. His skin glowed and sweated into a shiny red-brown. His voice was deep and alluring. During twelve long and fierce years, he had fought to know and control himself. Indian Creek had forgotten the terrible child. Hugo's life at that time revolved less about himself than it had during his first years, and that was both natural and fortunate. If his classmates in school and the older people of the town had not discounted his early physical precocity, even his splendid vitality might not have been sufficient to prevent him from becoming moody and melancholy. But when, with the passage of time, he tossed no more bullies, carried no more barrels of temptation, built no more fortresses, and grew so handsome that the matrons of Indian Creek as well as the adolescent girls in high school, followed him with wayward glances, when the men found him a gay and comprehending companion for any sport or adventure, when his teachers observed that his intelligence was often embarrassingly acute, when he played on three teams and was elected an officer in his classes each year. Then that half of Hugo, which was purely mundane and human, dominated him and made him happy. His adolescence, his emotions, were no different from those of any young man of his age and character. If his ultimate ambitions followed another trajectory, he postponed the evidence of it. Hugo was in love with Anna Blake, the girl who had attracted him when he was six. The residents of Indian Creek knew it. Her family received his calls with the winking tolerance which the middle class grants to young passion. And she was warm and tender and flirtatious and shy according to the policies that she had learned from custom. The active part of Hugo did not doubt that he would marry her after he had graduated from the college in Indian Creek, that they would settle somewhere nearby, and that they would raise a number of children. His subconscious thoughts made reservations that he, in moments when he was intimate with himself, would admit frankly. It made him a little ashamed of himself to see that on one night he would sit with Anna and kiss her ardently until his body ached, and on another he would deliberately plan to desert her. His idealism at that time was very great and untried, and it did not occur to him that all men are so deliberately calculating in the love they disguise as absolute. Anna had grown into a very attractive woman. Her figure was rounded and tall. Her hair was darker than the waxy curls of her childhood, and a vital gleam had come into it. Her eyes were still as blue, and her voice, shorn of its faltering youngness, was sweet and clear. She was undoubtedly the prettiest girl in high school, and the logical sweetheart for Hugo Danner, a flower ready to be plucked at eighteen. When Hugo reached his senior year, that readiness became almost an impatience. Girls married at an early age in Indian Creek. She looked down the corridor of time during which he would be in college. She felt the pressure of his still slumbering passion, and she sensed his superiority over most of the town boys. Only a very narrow critic would call her resultant tactics dishonorable. They were too intensely human, and too clearly born of social and biological necessity. She had let him kiss her when they were sixteen and afterwards, before she went to sleep, she sighed rapturously at the memory of his warm, firm lips, his strong, rough arms. Hugo had gone home through the dizzily spinning dusk, through the wind strummed trees and the fragrant fields, his breath deep in his chest, his eyes hot and somewhat understanding. Gradually, Anna increased that license. She knew, and she did not know what she was doing. 
She played a long game in which she said, if our love is consummated too soon, the social loss will be balanced by a speedier marriage because Hugo is honorable. But that will never happen. Two years after that first kiss, when they were floating on the narrow river in a canoe, Hugo unfastened her blouse and exposed the creamy beauty of her bosom to the soft moonlight, and she did not protest. That night he nearly possessed her, and after that night he learned through her unspoken voluptuous suggestion all the technique of love-making this side of consummation. When finally he called one night at her house and found that she was alone and that her parents and her brother would not return until the next day. They looked at each other with a shining agreement. He turned the lights out, and they sat on the couch in the darkness, listening to the passing of people on the sidewalk outside. He undressed her. He whispered halting, passionate phrases. He asked her if she was afraid, and let himself be laughed away from his own conscience. Then he took her and loved her. Afterwards, going home again in the gloom of late night, he looked up at the stars, and they stood still. He realized that a certain path of life had been followed to its conclusion. He felt initiated into the adult world, and it had been so simple, so natural, so sweet. He threw a great stone into the river and laughed, and walked on after a while. Through the summer that followed, Hugo and Anna ran the course of their affair. They loved each other violently and incessantly, and with no other evil consequence than to invite the open humphs of village gossips and to involve him in several serious talks with her father. Their courtship was given the benefit of conventional doubt, however, and their innocence was hotly if covertly protested by the Blakes. Mrs. Danner coldly ignored every fragment of insinuation. She hoped that Hugo and Anna would announce their engagement, and she hinted that hope. Hugo himself was excited and absorbed. Occasionally he thought he was sterile, with an inclination to be pleased rather than concerned if it was true. He added tenderness to his characteristics, and he loved Anna too much. Toward the end of that summer she lost weight and became irritable. They quarreled once, and then again. The criteria for his physical conduct being vague in his mind, Hugo could not gauge it correctly, and he did not realize that the very ardor of his relation with her was abnormal. Her family decided to send her away, believing the opposite of the truth responsible for her nervousness and weakness. A week before she left, Hugo himself tired of his excesses. One evening, Dressing for a last passionate rendezvous, he looked in his mirror, as he tied his scarf, and saw that he was frowning. Studying the frown, he perceived with a shock what made it. He did not want to see Anna, to take her out, to kiss and rumple and clasp her, to return thinking of her, feeling her, sweet and smelling like her. It annoyed him. It bored him. He went through it uneasily and quarreled again. Two days later she departed. He acted his loss well, and she did not show her relief until she sat on the train, tired, shattered, and uninterested in Hugo and in life. And then she cried. But Hugo was through. They exchanged insincere letters. He looked forward to college in the fall, and then he received a letter from Anna saying that she was going to marry a man she had met and known for three weeks. It was a broken, gasping, apologetic letter. Everyone was outraged at Anna, and astounded that Hugo bore the shock so courageously. The upshot of that summer was to fill his mind with fetid memories, which abated slowly, to make him disgusted with himself and tired of Indian Creek. He decided to go to a different college, one far away from the scene of his painful youth and his disillusioned maturity. He chose Webster University because of the greatness of its name. If Abednego Dana was hurt at his son's defection from his own college, he said nothing. And Mrs. Dana, grown more silent and reserved, yielded to her son's unexpected decision. Hugo packed his bags one September afternoon with a feeling of dreaminess. He bade farewell to his family. He boarded the train. His mind was opaque. The spark burning in it was one of dawning adventure, buried in a mass of detail. 
He had never been far from his native soil, and now he was going to see cities and people who were almost foreign in the sophisticated East. But all he could dwell on was a swift cinema of a defeated little boy, a strong man who could never be strong, a surfeited love, a truant and dimly comprehensible blonde girl, a muddy street and a red station, a clapboard house, a sonorous church with hushed puppets in the pews, fudge parties, boats on the little river, cold winter, and ice over the mountains, and a fortress where once upon a time he had felt mightier than the universe. End of chapter 5